back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escow. There is something like despair on the left, it seems to me, and my next guest and I decided a while back, we briefly touched on it, that it might make for an interesting conversation. We're about to find out if that's true. Once I always look forward to his appearances on the show, Richard Wolf is an economist and eco economic historian. He's in the interest of time, I'll just say professor at a whole bunch of places. He, uh, including the new school in uh, New York City, a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is the host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV on Tuesday evenings and the author of several books, the latest of which is The Sickness is the System. And he joins us once again. So Richard Wolf, thanks for coming back on the program. Thank you, RJ. Glad to be here. You know, we talked, we touched on this topic maybe the last time we spoke, and it seemed like something that we both should really talk about because despair is a major factor, it seems to me, on the left. And coupled with it is something I might describe as almost a Stockholm syndrome where uh, the left has been captured by a kind of centrist, which is not politically center at all, but so-called centrist ideology, Democratic Party, they don't know how to break away, you know, I can't quit you, as they say in the movie, and um, that there's this kind of combination of low-lying despair or underlying despair and sense that, uh, I guess, at that on the one hand, something big needs to be done, and on the other hand, it can't be done, which kind of leads to uh, an unhappy state of being. And so I guess I would start by saying, first of all, do you find any truth in my, obviously it's a generalization, and it can't be true of everyone, but do you find any truth in uh, in that observation? Yes, I, I mean, I don't see how anyone could dispute that there are plenty of people out there who uh, are perfectly well described by what you just said. I mean, they're, they're there. I mean, I couldn't argue with it. I, I, I'd be amazed if anyone else did. Um, but as you might have guessed, I don't, I don't agree with that assessment of what's going on. Uh, I'm distressed as you are by that fact. It weakens the left, that, it, that so many of its people see the situation the way you describe. So it's a matter of enormous concern to me. But I come at it, just to put all the proverbial cards on the table, from a position that is not only different or opposed to that, but somewhat, um, I don't want to say surprised, because I'm not surprised, but Upset. Maybe that's the best way to say it. I, I'm upset that people are reacting uh, to that. And um, let me briefly tell you why I am uh, upset. You know, I was born in Ohio many years ago. I've lived my life here in the United States all the time. I've worked here all the time. Um, I have a sense of knowing the country pretty well. I pay a lot of attention. My job as a professor was basically to analyze the economic reality as it unfolded. Um, and here are, the, here are the, the, the conclusions that I have in my mind based on a lifetime in this country studying it. I mean, the larger world, too, but with a particular focus on the United States, which I've always had. Okay, the first sentence I would utter is the following, that the capitalist system of this country, the, the way it has organized the production and distribution of goods and services, which is all I mean by the economic uh, system or structure, um, capitalist in the sense that we have employers and employees and a labor market and all the rest of it, um, is on shakier ground as an institution than at any time in my lifetime. And it's not even close. This is not a judgment where I have to compare it now to say, I don't know, 30 years ago or 40. It's a whole nother level of basic dysfunction. And 
breakdown. And I'm not, I'm not meaning to shock anybody, but those are the words I think pretty well describe uh, what I see. Um, we have for the first time in our history, or at least my history as an American, uh, we have a serious economic competitor able to equal or outperform on a number of rather crucial dimensions of economics. By the way, crucial dimensions that I was taught here in the United States are the crucial dimensions. And indeed, those dimensions are things about which the defenders of capitalism were proud because they could point to the United States, at, for example, over the last century, as growing faster than most other countries, as raising wages further and faster than most other countries. I heard most of my adult life the, bo the boast that capitalism is a superior system because the standard of living of folks here in the United States, working people, was significantly higher than it was everywhere else or almost everywhere else. Those metrics of what makes for a successful economic system now indicate that the United States is absolutely not doing well and not even in comparison to other countries. I don't mean to pick uh, on China, but there is a certain, uh, what should I say, a certain tartness in using China as an example. But for the last 25 years, its economy has grown much faster, two to three times the rate of growth of that of the United States. Real wages in this country have been stagnant, basically, for the last 30 years. They've quadrupled the average real wage in China. I mean, that's not, you're not winning this competition. You're losing it. And, and this has to be somehow accounted for, you know, and, and you're reduced. And I'm going to stay with China just because in my head, I have to comment on it a lot. I'll use China as an example, but there are plenty of others. Uh, you see bizarre behavior. Uh, the Chinese have a Muslim minority, the Uyghur people, about which we all now know because the relationships between the government in China and that part of China are, let me leave it at this, troubled. Mm -hmm. but I, I don't know really enough to be sure what's going on, but there's enough information that something isn't, isn't going real well out there, uh, whatever the, the details may be. But for the United States, which has just come off 20 years of continuous warfare, killing the people and destroying the economies of both Afghanistan and Iraq, two Muslim countries, it doesn't put you in a really great place to talk like this about any other country, but in this case, China. And it's not just that, oh, yeah, it's always propaganda. I, I know that, that propaganda on one side or the other. But it, there's something, when you have to reach that far into the realm of the weird, it means there's something in your position that isn't very solid because you're having to do stuff, which I mean, I know from talking to people in other countries strikes them as absolutely bizarre as a basis uh, for a country's the foreign policy, which these days it is, or, or portraying um, the Chinese as somehow a danger and an aggression. You know, there is no Chinese Navy in American waters, and there is half the American Navy right on their coast. I mean, who, who's supposed to be fooled by all of this? I, I know the answer, RJ. I know the answer is made for domestic consumption. It is. But the, the, the reach you have to deal, deal with here, it is astonishing. Uh, watching, just to shift the focus, watching over the last few days as this very limited initiative called the so-called billionaires tax go down to defeat uh, alongside all the other, or almost all the other initiatives that were supposed to to deal with our difficulties, this is pathetic. It's beyond making you upset or angry. There's something really crazy 
about a society suffering the downturns, the divisions, the hostilities, and it can't do anything. It, it, it gives me this sense of a society like the, 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 that proverbial antelope that gets caught in the headlines, uh, headlights, excuse me, of an oncoming vehicle and doesn't manage to get out of the way in time. We seem to be, and I'm, you know, I won't go into the climate change stuff, which is the same pathetic kind of inaction and, and on with the norms uh, of a society that is not working. And the reason I mention all of this is I am very confident that it may take a long time. It may even take too long a time. But this is not a sustainable arrangement. This system has painted itself into a corner from which I, at least at this point, don't see an exit. And that means the disaffection and the division, they're going to get worse. And I would look at the last year or two, the end of Trump, the beginning of Biden, as evidence that, I mean, neither of these people is solving the, the problems we have, and they are arguably making them worse. And, and the only thing I see Mr. Biden doing that's sort of really impressive to me is continuing the, the uh, uh, expulsion of immigrants, about which he shouldn't have any pride. He should have shame. Trump did it. It solved nothing in the way of America's problems. Biden's doing it will also not. And so it reminds me again to go back to where I started with this poking of the Chinese in the eye, whether it be with the Navy or with silly remarks about Taiwan or any of the other things. This is this is childish behavior. It doesn't befit a country that was once the dominant empire of the world and is now acting more and more like the peak of that empire is well behind us and we're heading down and it's time for us to take stock of that reality and deal with it. And the left, here's the irony that may provoke you. The left has something to say about this. It's the left that's even willing to say the words I just said to open the very idea, and I'm not the only one, of course, but to open the idea that, that we are not in a position of strength. And saying so doesn't make it so. It, it is a reality. There was a reason that the head of the military in the United States in the waning uh, weeks of Mr. Trump's regime had to call his counterpart in China to reassure them that what was coming out of the president's mouth was to be taken with an enormous grain of salt and not to worry. I mean, what, what, you know, <laughs> what? These are signs for me, not one or the other, but the accumulation of them, that the left has a, an analysis and it has a suggestion, system change, Sure, it's going to be bad mouth by all the powers that be, but that's normal. They don't have a solution. That's why we're wobbling between Republican and Democrat, each of which has a lot of truth when they lambaste the other about having solved nothing, which each of them makes sure the other one doesn't. We're watching that spectacle. We're not part of that. And that's going to give us real um, power to reach the people of this country in the months and years ahead. Well, you know, the metaphor that comes to mind sometimes when I think about this system, and I think about it a lot, is, you know, the way a black hole forms, right? A singularity, the star gets heavier and denser and gets harder and harder for things to escape it. And eventually it becomes impossible for anything, even light, to escape the gravitational force that starts to collapse in on itself. And sometimes I feel we're at that stage now. Obviously, I, you know, we could both be wrong, but it seems to me that if even these modest attempts to launch, whether it's a billionaire's tax or to control drug prices, which every person in this country wants, or, or, or some of these other things, if they're brought back down by the increasing gravity, they're sucked in by this system of, you know, exploitation, then to me, it's already past the, whatever they call it, event horizon, the point of 
uh, inevitable. Again, I could be wrong, but it seems to me that looking, you know, I always like to alleviate people in the short term. I'm not a messiah. If there's a law, it's going to come along. I hope people pay their rent. I'm all for it and so on. But it seems to me that systemically placing our hope in something that seems to be in a system of irrevocable decline is itself a prescription for despair. Absolutely. I think that uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in full agreement. I, I'm searching for a way um, to, to get at this that might illuminate it from yet another angle. In 1989, that system, which we call the Soviet Union, collapsed in on itself. It wasn't overwhelmed in a war. It wasn't attacked or invaded. It did not have a catastrophic event. Uh, Chernobyl happened quite a while before uh, all of these things, and so on and so on. And I remember someone, I don't remember who it was, saying on some talk show that before we celebrate uh, too much, you remember that, that euphoria of the 1990s, sort of the end of history, uh, the, the great struggle between capitalism and socialism was over. One had won, the other one had lost, et cetera, et cetera. And someone cautioned, I don't even remember which side of all of that he was on, but he said something like, be very, very careful. Anything and everything that happened to the Soviet Union can and then he stopped for a kind of a pregnant pause and said, probably will happen here too. Given the absurdity of nuclear war as literally uh, an act of suicide by a, by a planet in which nobody wants to commit this event, um, putting that aside for the moment, that what will develop is the contradictions of a system will often be alleviatable. They will be overcomable. Uh, you will get another lease on life. Uh, you'll dodge the proverbial bullet, all of it. But then there will come a set of circumstances when you can't. And when those contradictions you kind of knew were there become unmanageable. And, you know, I think we are very close to that situation. And I wouldn't be all that surprise uh, to see it. For me, the January 6th events in Washington were not the assault on democracy. I literally do not understand quite what people mean with, with such language. But it was an event that evoked the absurd and excessive use of language because everybody understood that this was a kind of evidence that the level of disagreement and hostility was becoming socially unmanageable. Uh, those people cannot be stopped. They're going to continue to do these things. Um, you can see it all around you. Uh, and, I, and there's nothing being done that really recognizes uh, the, what the underlying issues are and addresses them, if anything. The spectacle of the politicians in Washington is a spectacle of grotesque inattention. Again, a metaphor, the famous fiddling in Rome while the city burned. Uh, we see Republicans and Democrats playing their little maneuver games to win the office for this senator against that one or for this party against that. And it's as if, uh, hello, gentlemen, ladies, there's a catastrophe all around you. What are you doing maneuvering around as usual? You know, you can't have it both ways. If you want to say that we just came through the worst public health disaster this country has suffered, which is true, happening together with the second or third worst economic collapse in the country's history, and that we've never before had the simultaneity of two such catastrophes, and that therefore we need a response that is in some sense uh, comparable to or adequate to the level of crisis. Nothing like that is happening. 
the first thing Mr. Biden proposed, the three and a half trillion dollar uh, family rescue, whatever the different names of it have, have, have been, even that was nowhere near adequate. And that is being pared down to a caricature of itself. Uh, and again, everyone seems to think, oh, well, this is sort of the normal politicking. Yeah, but you're not in a normal situation. And therefore, this is really weird. As is, I've tried to show the, 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 the business with the billionaires, the business with China. You know, these are desperate acts. Keep Americans focused on little tit-for-tat provocations, which the Chinese, by the way, and the rest of the world look like the souls of probity, the souls of not wanting to get this, this crazy child yanking about with its, its desperation uh, off the rails here. You know, that itself, that I can paint such a caricature, which I do, and everybody nods because everybody sees it, that too, like you said a minute ago, RJ, that too is a sign. The very discussion of the crisis is a manifestation of it. You know, going, Rich Wolf, going back to this, this idea of despair, right? Despair comes i'm not a psychologist but despair comes in when to me often when we don't fully acknowledge the reality and don't think we can do anything about it so i think a lot of people either don't look at the square in the face they don't look at the scope if we counted the numbers properly we'll almost certainly have a million dead from, from COVID 19 already we right. don't look at uh, you know, the for its parameters, the government flooded. Uh, they didn't do that much, but the, by its own standards, government flooded the country with money, uh, managed to avert a total sub social uprising. So they think, we we got past that. Uh, so there's this sort of we're not thinking about the fact 38 percent of people don't know how they're going to pay the rent to mortgage and these other devastating statistics we see out there. Um, people are just saying, oh, well, we made it. You know, we basically, we made it. I'm okay. Everybody I know is okay. So there's this kind of denial. And it seems to me that, uh, and for liberals and the left, uh, broadly speaking, as, you know, Biden's doing the best he can, just as he used to say, Obama's doing the best he can. There's a kind of faith in leaders as opposed to, I've always been told you know, if you want to get emotionally healthy, look at your situation as hard as it may be. Because once you recognize, whether it's you're going broke, whether it's your marriage is more, whatever it may be, once you recognize uh, the reality of it, you can do something about it. But until you do something, until you recognize it, you'll just have this kind of free form depression. Sometimes I think a lot of people who are nominally or instinctively of the left have that depression and it either manifests in despair or even at anger against people like you or me or Bernie Sanders, whoever it is, because their worldview is being challenged instead of kind of saying, well, no, let's take a look at this thing as it really is. Do you get what I'm driving at in terms of this Absolutely. cognitive dissonance? Oh, no, I, again, we are in agreement, but I keep coming back to certain themes that strike me as important. Um, when I started doing the more public v version of what I now do, uh, rather than being a professor in the classroom, which is what I did most of my life, but become more public, I expected what indeed I had often encountered as a professor, that I would start to, to present whatever it is I had, and it would be so troubling to people that I would get lots of pushback you know, and wanting me to, to change my topic and discuss how Stalin killed millions of people or something along those lines. Uh, I don't get that anymore, or mm -hmm. any once in a while. But basically, the unless I'm in a debate with, I don't know, a right winger, and I do some of that, or, or a libertarian, and I do some of that, yeah, that, then the old anti-lefty stuff comes right up quickly. But for most of my audiences... Uh, I don't get that anymore. I mean, they're really more interested. They don't necessarily agree with me. I'm not asserting that at all. But they find it interesting. They want to think about it. They ask questions that show that they're grappling with it. 
they may go in a direction I wouldn't or that I would oppose, and that happens. But I, I get the sense there's an audience for the leftist critique I offer that never existed before uh, on the scale that it now uh, does. It's just, and I am, I admit, I am very lifted up by that. I'm very, I don't have a, a, a despair. Um, and I think there is a very healthy process going on, exactly what you described. I usually attribute that to the 12 step programs, which, you know, usually require that the, one of the first steps is you have to get up there and in a kind of public way, admit that you have whatever the problem is that brought you to that 12 step program uh, because of your argument. You, you can't get very far with the solution if you're not yet clear that there is something to be solved here. And, and it's important that you say it about yourself as a kind of, uh, of, of prologue to what is what is then going to come. Uh, so, and well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but to paraphrase the step one of Alcoholics Anonymous, what we're talking about here is saying we're powerless over capitalism. Our lives have become unmanageable. Yes. And I think that's what the American people are kicking and screaming, no doubt, but are being dragged into that recognition from in different ways, with different idioms, uh, in different political directions, and those are scary sometimes. But it, the, the world they knew, the world they anticipated, the world their parents told them they were going to inherit just isn't there. And they are looking around, oh, did I misplace it? No, it's not there. It's not available to you. you right. You're not just having a temporary situation where you're doing uh, a quarter of a job over here and two thirds of a job over there, cobbling these things together, worrying about it, being not a proletarian, but a precariat worker, all of these things. These are not temporary. This is not going away. It, to call the gig economy the sharing economy doesn't do anything about the fact that you can't live like that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The question now is, will we on the left, and here maybe what you're saying is very, very practically urgent, will the left understand that with the suffering, with the suffering and the delay of doing things that is frustrating, there is also, sorry about this, that's okay. That's okay. It's, I'm glad that you're being called upon to, uh, you know, by more and more people. Um, go ahead. Here's the point. This despair is one way of reacting, as you just said. But if we let that be us now, we will have missed, in my opinion, one of the great opportunities to really change the direction of the United States. It's not accidental that the last time an upsurge of the left really changed this country, not enough, for sure, not deep enough, but the last time we did it was in the wake of a catastrophe called the Great Depression, when we suddenly had an emerging left that was very big and very powerful. The so-called New Deal coalition, the CIO, the two socialist parties, the communist party, working together with all of their disputes and struggles. But nonetheless, the left, whoa, we got Social Security, unemployment compensation, the first minimum wage, a public jobs program. Wow. And if you look at the statistics, the inequality of this country, which has been going up for most of its history, took a reverse dip during the 1930s, and it has taken us 30, 40 years to undo uh, after 45. So it seems to me that the left has a basis to say, if we can get our act together, if what we present to the American people is not despair, of which they have enough anyway, but some kind of plan, some kind of program, look, we are clearly generating the kinds of people that can be attractive even Bernie and the older old gentleman from Vermont was amazingly attractive to broad parts of the population. AOC is in her very different way. Likewise, very articulate, very clear, makes a good impression, knows how to present herself. 
and um, um, Corey Bush, and that, I don't mean to leave anyone out, but I'm impressed. We're beginning to generate the, the younger people and the broadly different people that can be in a position to do this. So, you know, I guess my, what I'm saying is I'm hoping that the despair you describe, with which I agree, I mean, you're right, it's there. I'm hoping that that's, you know, the darkest moment of the night is just before the dawn emerges. I'm, I'm hoping that this is whatever it is as a phase, as a period, uh, and that people will react to their own depression by wanting to overcome it by becoming active. And, in, in, and before I, I end this, I am taken, I am taken by those two statistics. The number of Americans that are quitting their jobs and mostly saying this, I remember the country and Western song about, I don't know, 20 years ago that began this way, take this job and shove it. Was I was it? thinking of that just this morning. That's really yeah. funny. You remember that? You remember that song? Yeah, I sure that, do. That's what I was thinking of it. Yeah. And that was the chorus. He comes back yeah. and the singer whose name I forget. Um, David that, Allen oh, Coe. Written by Steve Goodman, a folk singer. I was always very disappointed by the way, because the chorus was great. Take this job and shove it. But then the lyrics were about breaking up with his girlfriend or something. It's like, come on, man, you could have written a working man's anthem, working person's anthem here, and you were you make it about your uh, your uh, uh, girlfriend or whatever, but uh, still a great chorus. I think we need to bring that. Uh, I think you're going to see more songs coming out of the, the whole R&B Nashville business and elsewhere, too that is gonna reflect this mood because millions of people are quitting. And we have more strikes in America than we have seen in quite a while. And we have more public attention, both to the statistic on quitting and to the strikes. And that's just as important as the event that, that the public, even the mass media smell in some sense that something is shifting, something is changing. And for me, that's exactly what I'm looking for. People who are saying, I'm not just going to be depressed. I was depressed for the last 10 years in that crappy job. But somehow the pandemic, when I had to stay home for a few months, makes me see it in a new way. And I'm not going to subject myself, my family, to, to what this, this is crazy. This is just crazy. And sure, if you quit, what are you going to find at the next job? Pretty much the same story. But that, it's still, it's a learning process. The people who are striking are making, in my mind, a, a better choice. They're going to try to change uh, this, but they're going to see well, how capital responds. And in that conversation and in that process, if a left is there with a, a systemic criticism a lot of those people are going to find it very palatable. And as this system collapses, let's all plan on being there to help design, lay out the plan for the system to come. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But as always, Richard Wolf, economist, host of Economic Update. Uh, as always, uh, a pleasure speaking with you. And thanks for coming on the program. Thank you, RJ. And these conversations are important. And I, I, I want to compliment you because it, particularly over the last three or four months, we have gotten quite a few emails to Democracy at Work referring to, commenting on what they heard you and I discussing. So I, I take That's my wonderful. hat off to you. It's very nice for me and it's good news for you too. And there's someone calling to compliment these conversations now. So, all right, Richard Wolf, as always, a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to speaking soon. Thank you, RJ. And I'll be more careful to have my phone out of the room next time. No worries. Uh, and we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard RJ Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.